NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. After a person is charged with a crime, a judge must make a determination as to uh, whether to release a person from jail while waiting for trial and what conditions, if any, to impose for as a condition of bond. When a judge is making that decision, they are supposed to um, decide using several different factors, including the facts and circumstances of the arrest, uh, the defendant's ability to pay, um, a criminal history, the safety of the community, and the safety of the victim. And this isn't an exhaustive list. There is case law in Texas that says a judge may use other consideration and factors as well. When gathering that information, the judge is supposed to use a variety of sources. For example, in regards to the facts and circumstances of the arrest, the judge uses what is called a DIMS summary. And that's basically a sworn statement from the police officer which lays out the reasons for the, the defendant's arrest. They also use a printout from, the, from TCIC, NCIC, which has the defendant's entire criminal history, and they use information prepared by pretrial in what is called a pretrial report. The pretrial report is cre created by pretrial officers who do an interview with each of the defendants and gather a variety of information related to the defendant. This includes their biographical information, such as their age, uh, their ethnicity, their sex, those type of things. They also collect information from the defendant about um, if, whether they have dependents or not, whether they support other individuals, whether it's children, sometimes elderly parents, those type of things. The defendant's educational background, the defendant's financial responsibilities and obligations, sometimes um, the uh, individual may be 17 or 18, they live at home with mom and dad, maybe they don't have a lot of responsibilities financially. On the other hand, it could be someone who is a single parent with three or four children who may also take care of an elderly parent. They work, but their job just barely meets the bills. They may also receive some type of government assistance um, and therefore might be considered indigent. The pretrial officer collects information related to a defendant's medical and mental health, either pre past or present. It makes a huge difference whether someone has uh, present mental health issues for which they're currently receiving treatment. Maybe they've had past diagnosis, but they're no longer receiving treatment. They're not on their medication. Maybe the defendant has a very serious illness, such as cancer, for which they're receiving treatment. It's important that they get released to continue their treatment. All of those things are relevant. Um, and so the pretrial officers talk to the individuals during the interview to try to gather that information. However, there are problems with the pretrial report and um, the information contained in it. First, the interviewer could be biased, and that bias could make its way into the report. The bias of the interviewer could also affect the amount and type of information collected from the defendant. For instance, if the defendant is charged with a particular crime that maybe the pretrial officer has certain thoughts or feelings about, they may interview the defendant in a certain kind of way, which then will affect whether the defendant answers questions, how they answer questions. People can tell when there is sometimes an animosity with the person they're speaking to. And animosity will often result in someone shutting down. Also, the defendant's medical, mental, and or cognitive state at the time of this interview will affect the type of information that is given by the defendant, um, how that information is relayed. Sometimes a defendant may be in the middle, in the middle of a mental health crisis. Uh, maybe he or she is not currently on their medication. Maybe they have learning disabilities. They could have serious medical problems that affect uh, their state of mind. Uh, maybe someone is charged with assault and has been in a fight and they are 
injured. Maybe they've been bleeding. They had a, have a black eye. They have a headache. Those type of things will affect how the defendant hears the questions, interprets the questions, and responds to the questions. Um, the defendant may be sleep deprived, hungry, um, cold, hot, um, going through other mental or emotional issues. And all of the, those, those type of things can affect what type of information they provide to the pretrial officer. Sometimes a person just doesn't feel good. It may be three in the morning and they really don't want to answer questions about where they grew up, where they live, who their job supervisor is, those type of things even though it may be really important and relevant to the later determination in the bail hearing. The other thing is that the pretrial report cannot give the judge information as to whether a defendant is likely to commit a new crime while out on bond and or whether the defendant is likely to appear or fail to appear in court. Those factors cannot be provided to the judge with that information based on this is where you live, this is where you grew up, this is what type of job you have. Even though the judge may have at their disposal, disposal several different things to use to take into consideration when deciding whether to release a defendant out on bond, whether to impose pretrial conditions, my experience has been is that ju judges often rely on a defendant's criminal history and they rely on a... Um, bail schedule that's been created by the misdemeanor and felony judges. Um, a bail schedule means that the judges have gotten together, they have looked at different types of offenses, different degrees of offenses, and predetermined the amount that will be applied for that particular offense. For example, um, a Class B misdemeanor, the recommended bail may be $500. For a DWI second, the recommended bail may be $2,000. And for instance, a misdemeanor assault family violence case, the recommended bail may be anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000. Of course, the judge can always deviate from that, but again, my experience has been is that the judges often stick with that bail schedule, um, and they um, don't want to deviate from that amount. And again, the bail schedule cannot provide the judge with any type of, type of information as to whether the defendant will appear in court or whether the defendant will commit a new offense while out on bond. The problem with relying on criminal history is that a person's prior convictions may be actually related to their prior inability to pay a surety bond or a cash bond for pretrial release. So if in the past a person was unable to afford to you know, post bond, then when they get to court, that person may decide to plead guilty as a way to secure their release from jail rather than stay in jail and continue to fight their case. So a person then may get multiple convictions for prior misdemeanors that really aren't very serious or related to the, to the safety of the community and really have nothing to do with whether the person will appear in court or commit a new offense while out on bond because in reality, they've never been given that opportunity. So they have a criminal history that inflates their scores but is not reflective of what will actually happen if they are released. Um, when using um, a bail schedule to assign a money bail amount, it also does not take into consideration those factors as to whether a person will fail to appear or whether a person will commit a new offense. And instead what happens is we end up with a system where those who can afford to pay are released and those who are, cannot pay are detained. And so it has nothing to do with the safety of the community. If a person with, if two different people with the same charge, the same criminal history, the same background, um, one is able to pay to get released, the other must stay detained because they can't pay. The person who can pay gets out regardless of whether they are a danger to the community and regardless of whether they are likely to return to court or not. And of course, this means that those that are poor are the ones that are disproportion disproportionately affected. Those are, that are poor are the ones that are disproportionately detained in jail. And then 
in turn increases the likelihood that they will take a conviction because people don't want to stay in jail to try to fight their case, especially if they go to court and the court, um, the prosecutor says, we'll give you time served on this misdemeanor trespass case. Of course, the person says, oh, well, that means I can get out today. And they plead guilty and they are released from jail. It's much easier to fight a case when a person is not locked up in a cage. The Arnold Foundation um, is an organization that is attempting to change the way um, courts are determining the issues related to bail and how courts are deciding whether to release someone um, on a bail amount um, and imposing conditions. The reason that the Arnold Foundation began doing this is that they wanted to address the issues related to relying on criminal history, um, relying on a bail schedule, and the bias in the pretrial interview. Um, in addition to the problems that I mentioned before, a pretrial interview can be costly, it can take, be, um, uh, take up an inordinate amount of time, um, where people who don't need a pretrial interview are using resources and officers' time when really, based on um, a different assessment tool, the court could have a quick snapshot about those factors related to whether a person is likely to commit a new crime and or whether they're likely to appear in court. Um, this information that I provide in this PowerPoint is actually found on the Arnold Foundation's website, and I've cited there www.arnoldfoundation.org. The good thing about the Arnold Foundation is that they really want to be transparent. They really want to provide their information so that anyone can log in, or not log in, anyone could go online and see the tool that they're using, how they came up with this tool, the scoring factors, and those type of things. Um, I, this quote was on the website, and I, I thought this was really um, an excellent way to describe what they have created, which is called the Public Safety Assessment, and we refer to it as the PSA. And it says, the PSA is a research-based, data-driven pretrial risk assessment tool that provides judges with objective information about the likelihood that a defendant will commit a new crime or will fail to appear in court. The PSA was created when researchers gathered over 750,000 documents from more than 300 jurisdictions. They analyzed these documents to try to come up with risk factors that they think um, are most predictive of whether someone will appear in court and or whether someone will commit a new criminal offense or a new violent criminal offense. They ultimately determined that there are nine risk factors that are most predictive of these behaviors. And they actually use its new criminal activity, which is also um, referred to in, in the PSA, which I'll show you in just a bit, um, NCA, new violent criminal activity is NVCA and failure to appear FTA. The factors are weighted and they've created an al algorithm which creates a score for new criminal activity, new violent criminal activity, failure to appear, and a risk level. And their risk levels can be broken down into below average risk, average risk, above average risk, and high risk. The PSA risk factors, as I mentioned, there's nine PSA risk factors. It includes whether the current offense is violent, and the Arnold Foundation actually has, as part of their scoring, um, they include a list of what they believe are the violent offenses that should be used for scoring, whether the defendant has a pending charge at the time of the current offense, whether the defendant has a prior misdemeanor conviction, whether the defendant has a prior felony conviction, um, whether the defendant has prior convictions for violent offenses. And when I say violent offenses, of course, the standard of what someone would think, um, murder, um, sex assault, assault, burglary of a habitation, those are just some of the offenses that are considered violent. And they also consider um, attempted for any one of these offenses or conspiracy to commit any one of these offenses. Um, also, uh, um, 
other risk factors, the defendant's age at the time of the arrest for the current offense, how many times the defendant has failed to appear at a pretrial hearing in the two years prior to the current offense, and whether the defendant has failed to appear at a pretrial hearing more than two years ago. The PSA does not take into consideration a defendant's juvenile history or their juvenile record. Um, it does not take into consideration any offense where incarceration in jail or prison is not a penalty of that offense. So in Texas, is any Class C misdemeanor, which is basically traffic tickets or something like public intoxication, those are not taken into consideration. Um, it is not meant to be used for a defendant who is charged with an offense while incarcerated. So if someone is in jail and they are charged with, for example, assault on a detention officer, the PSA is not supposed to be used for that matter. And it's also not supposed to be used in any sentencing phase of a defendant's um, criminal case. It's only supposed to be used during the pretrial phase. This is an example of a PSA. Um, this is not a real defendant, but as you can see, the PSA at the top, it gives basically just a little bit of biographical information related to the defendant. Um, there is, if you look in the top left-hand corner, um, right above the initial black bar, it says new violent criminal activity flag. So if a defendant's current offense is a violent offense, that may say yes. It actually just says yes or no. Um, and then a score is given for new criminal activity and failure to appear. And then when you go down, you see the nine factors listed and it provides that information. Um, the age of the defendant, whether they are, you know, below or above a certain age. Um, for example, someone who is 45 charged with a crime is not considered as higher risk as, let's say, someone who is 18 charged with a crime. Um, and it basically it goes through and it lists whether they have prior misdemeanor conviction, whether they have prior felony conviction. It lists the number of prior violent convictions. Um, their prior failures to appear pre-trial in the past two years, prior um, um, failures to appear pre-trial older than two years, whether they've previously been sentenced um, to incarceration. And for purposes of the PSA um, for incarceration, um, you, the, you have to have been incarcerated at least 14 days or more for the sentence. Um, and I'm not sure how they came up with that, but the researchers did look at that and make a determination that um, lower amounts of incarceration should not be considered. One of the things that increases the score the most is if someone is picks up a, a new arrest while on bond for a, an offense. That, that factor alone significantly will increase someone's score. Um, they actually provide charts so that a person can go through on their own and do the scoring. And then you compare that scoring with a weight scale that the Arnold Foundation does provide on their website. They basically provide all the information related to the risk factors, how it's scored, the weights that are assigned to these different things, and whether... Um, um, and the algorithm to get the ultimate score. The Arnold Foundation also provides definitions for all of these things so that when someone is trying to do the score, they know whether something's considered uh, a pending offense, whether something's considered a failure to appear, um, whether something is counted as a prior failure to appear. For example, if someone has a bond forfeiture because they miss because they miss court, but on that same day, the court takes back that bond forfeiture, then that's not supposed to be considered as a failure to appear. The PSA is supposed to assist judges in making the decision about whether to release someone pre-trial. Um, again, it's supposed to be objective, whereas the Arnold Foundation did not believe that the pre-trial interview um, does not believe that it is objective. Um, it's opposed to not taking consideration whether someone has an ability to pay or not. Like um, a, a bail schedule, they believe is just arbitrary. You know, it's just assigning number to off numbers to offenses, and it does not take into consideration the other factors related to the defendant. Um, criminal history, as mentioned, 
can actually be very biased and weighted against the defendant. If a person has convictions because they were unable to be released from jail and they took convictions because they were too poor to uh, um, pay a surety bond or a cash bond. And that actually brings me to another point that me and my colleagues often discuss and about when it comes to paying a surety bond or paying a cash bond. It's not just about whether someone has the money. Someone may actually have the money. However, they may not have access to those funds. We often interview people who say, hey, I have money on my debit card. Well, where's your debit card? Well, it's in my property. Okay. Um, what well, do you have someone that you can release that debit card to? No. Or um, maybe they say, I have some money under my mattress at home. Um, however, my keys are in my property, or I don't have someone who can go to my home and get that money. Or maybe I have someone who can go and get that money, but that person is not willing to go to a bondsman, maybe because that person has a warrant out, or they don't have a valid ID. Um, I actually talked to a family member the other day when I was interviewing a young man charged with a crime and he said, oh, um, my sister is going to go post the bond for me. So I called her and she had already been at the bonding company. She actually had just left because she said that she needed a co-signer. His bail amount was $1,000. That was actually really surprising to me that she needed a co-signer when all she had needed to pay was approximately $100 plus whatever fees the bondsman may be charging, but they wanted her to have a, a co-signer on a bail amount of $1,000. So there's a lot of other factors that go into whether someone is able to secure their release um, by paying money, and it doesn't just come down solely as to whether they have the money or not. Someone may have the money but may not have the resources or the uh, family member or friend who can go pay it for them. In um, developing and creating the PSA, the Arnold Foundation stresses that it, the PSA is not meant to replace judges. It's not to, meant to impede a judge's decision about pretrial lease, and it is not meant um, to take away their authority in any kind of way. It's actually just supposed to be an objective tool that the judge can use in deciding whether to release a defendant or not. In Harris County, um, during the bail hearing, the judge will have a copy of the PSA, but aside from that, they also have the defendant's entire criminal history and the pretrial report. The problem with that, criminal history is relevant. It's always relevant, and it's not fair to say it's not relevant. However, what often happens is that the judge will look more closely or delve into the criminal history because um, they see, oh, well, this person has a prior felony conviction, and then they want to go in and see what the conviction for, when, when, that, when that person was convicted. And oftentimes, they take and use a person's criminal history against them in a much more significant way when as they're really supposed to be more relying on the PSA for that information. Because the PSA, again, is what is supposed to give them information as to the likelihood that a defendant will appear, appear in court and the likelihood that he or she will commit a new offense while on pretrial release. Criminal history cannot do that. To further complicate problems in Harris County, the misdemeanor judges and the felony judges have a bail schedule that they then have correlated to the PSA scores. So whereas the PSA is just supposed to provide the information that's listed, those nine factors, and provide the judge with a score that a person's below average risk, average risk, above average risk, or high risk, um, the judges have decided to say, okay, if a person's below average risk and they commit a class B misdemeanor, the recommended bail is 500. If they are above average risk for a class B misdemeanor, the recommended bail may be 1500. So they are correlating a bail amount with the risk levels. And the Arnold Foundation specifically says that they aren't supposed to do this, that the PSA is not meant to recommend a bail amount. 
This is an example of the felony bail schedule or not this example, this is the felony bail schedule used in Harris County. Um, and basically, as you see, it lists the degree of offenses. State jail felonies are the lowest level felonies, um, punishable by um, six months to up to two years in state jail. Um, through second degree, oddly enough, they have left off first degree offenses or charges, and there is no uh, recommended bail for that. Um, Although the general consensus from um, many of the hearing officers is that if it's first degree, then at minimum you start at around fifty thousand dollars. As you see, they've just plugged in numbers. If you're and what's really interesting, if you look on state jail felony, on the third column where it says above average risk, um, which means you score a five, the recommended bail is 15,000. But if you are above average risk for a third degree, which is a more serious offense than a state jail felony, the recommended bail is 10,000. So there's really no rhyme or reason for how this bail schedule and the, you know, works and how they've chosen their numbers. On the next page, we now, this is the misdemeanor bail schedule. And the misdemeanor judges actually made the misdemeanor bail schedule even more complicated. Um, and interestingly enough, if you look over to the left-hand column, it lists out what they call carve-out situations. So any assault involving family violence, um, even if a person is below average risk, so that means they score a 1-1 one, one, or a 2-1. One. So 1-1 one, one is the lowest you can score. Even if you score below average risk, there's no presumption of a personal bond, there's no initial bail amount, and the recommended ba bail amount at the hearing is anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000. So that means if a person gets arrested on a misdemeanor assault family violence case, it could be their first arrest. Um, however, they cannot get a bail amount until they go to probable cause court. So even if they have money, um, and even if they have someone who can post their bond, they must sit in jail until they make it to PC court. Um, and in fact, if you go through this bail schedule for Harris County, you see how often they say no presumption of a personal bond, no initial bail amount, and then provide a recommended bail amount. So anywhere it's where it says no initial bail amount, that means the person will not have an amount set until they go to probable cause court, which then results in many um, misdemeanor defendants basically spending up to two days in jail before they make it in front of a hearing officer to get a bail amount, even though it just may be a misdemeanor class B criminal trespass case. Um, as I mentioned, it said it's not supposed to be used um, um, with assigning bail. And in fact, on their website, it specifically says the PSA has nothing to do with the process of assigning bail. The PSA is a good tool to use when you are representing a defendant during a bail hearing. Um, but it's really important to check the PSA score and the risk assessment against the cr uh, defendant's criminal history if possible. Um, any mistake in scoring can result in a higher recommended bail under the bail schedule because the person's going to ha have a higher risk level. I'll give you a good example. Um, I represented a young man who was charged with driving while license suspended, but his score was re um, inflated to say that he was above average risk because it said that he had a pending charge. When I asked him about it, he said, no, I don't have any pending cases. Um, and so then I went in and I checked and the pending that they were referring to because the um, pretrial officer had listed it in the notes section. I don't know if this box, there is a section at the bottom that is for notes. And they had listed the offense in the notes section. When I went to look up the offense, the offense had been disposed three months before. But they listed it as a pending charge. And so anytime a person has a pending charge, that's automatically going to significantly inflate their score. So he was listed as above average risk without a bail amount set on a driving while suspended case, even though he should have been listed as average risk with a $500 bail amount set, okay? And that's 
I mean, that's a lot because basically he was unable to be released from jail until he went in front of a hearing officer. In regards to that, you really want to make sure that you check um, the PSA score to make sure it's checked or correct. The other thing is that the pretrial officers often put notes in the PSA section. Um, some of it is relevant and some of it is not. And for example, it is relevant if a person has a pending case. It is relevant if a person's currently on deferred. It is relevant if a person's on parole. Those things are important and relevant for a judge to take in consideration. What is not important or relevant, in my opinion, is a person who's charged with a misdemeanor trespass case, and it says in the notes section, the defendant has two prior TDC convictions. Who cares? The person is entitled to bail. It is a he's charged with a misdemeanor, um, and there's often mistakes on in those things on the notes as well. I've had. I've seen notes where it says the defendant's on parole and the defendant's not on parole. I saw one where it said that a defendant was a registered sex offender. Um, he was not a registered sex offender and not required to be a registered sex offender. And in fact, had never been charged with any type of sex offense. Um, and it actually said that he was a registered sex offender in Virginia. Um, and he said, I've never even been to Virginia. Um, and when I went back with the pretrial officer and went through the criminal history, it was a totally different person. But that's important because it didn't affect his score, but there's a note in a record that's going to go before not only a hearing officer, but also the judge in his court and could possibly be a public record that says he is a registered sex offender. Okay. And some of the judges are very good that if you point out um, inaccurate notes, they will ask the pretrial officers to correct them to take out the notes. Um, there's also things often listed in the NCIC, TCIC, the criminal history database that is incorrect. We often see pretrial officers list things such as defendant is a documented gang member. Um, that's a whole separate issue about whether someone's been, um, is a documented gang member, but it does become a problem when a person is charged with driving while license suspended and they're 35. Obviously, even if at some point or another they were a documented gang member, being a documented gang member has nothing to do with their current offense. And if someone is 35, the fact that they are still active is probably you know, slim to none. But that obviously biases the judge or can bias the judge and can obviously lead to inflating someone's, you know, bail amount or the type of conditions that that person gets released on. The way we use the bail or the PSA during our presentation for a client, we like to point out, obviously, the positive things. Um, and I will say that sometimes you don't have a lot to work with, but we do try to um, point out things uh, if the person, I like to say, you know, Your Honor, Mr. Smith scores a 4-3. Uh, he is considered average risk. He has no pending charges, no new violent criminal activity flag, and no prior failures to appear pretrial in the past two years or older than two years. Um, just to get it out there, even though the judge has that in front of them and can see it for themselves, it's important for you to say it out loud to the judge um, because who knows whether they, you know, are taking that into consideration or not. Sometimes judges, even though they have a PSA score in front of them, some judges like to go on record about a defendant's prior criminal history anyway, um, which is we sometimes warn our clients about and explain to them that, you know, when you're standing in front of judge so-and-so, um, he or she may decide to go through your entire criminal history on the record. And we understand that that's embarrassing and frustrating and, and is going to make you angry. I like to tell them to imaginary, you know, close your, pretend you are closing your ears, go into your happy place in your mind, like try to ignore it as much as possible because it really is um, humiliating for some of the defendants for the judge to go through their criminal history on the record. Especially if someone is a, a, an older individual, maybe 50 or 60, 
and they may have criminal history that goes back 40 years. Um, in those situations, we like to remind the judges that the PSA takes that person's criminal history into account. And even though, Your Honor, he may have those priors, he scores out at average risk, he has no pending charges, no prior failures to appear, whatever it may be. Um, sometimes what we do if we know, um, when a judge starts reading out someone's criminal history, um, and I see that you went to prison for robbery, we like to say, and judge, when was that? And then the judge has to say, that was in 1998. Oh, so 20 years ago, he went to prison for robbery. You know, and it's, um, you know, you obviously want to be respectful, but it is frustrating when they do that to your client and your client standing up there. And sometimes you can just feel them kind of like the shame of it, you know, and they feel very embarrassed. And sometimes the judges will... Um, read out things or say things that are incorrect. Um, I had one judge um, mention that my client had a prior, he said, I see uh, convictions for sex assault, for robbery, and he goes on and on and on. Um, this individual um, was mid thirties and he was charged with a misdemeanor assault family violence case. And um, I knew about his priors, and so, and I had told him before we went up there that the judge was probably not going to approve him for a personal bond um, because of his priors. Um, and when we, and of course the judge did not, and he set bail at 3,000, which he could have done without going into this big show about the person's priors because that's what he was going to do anyway. But when we walked off, the client said to me, he whispered to me, why is the judge going into my juvenile history? And as I mentioned, um, the individual is a, was about 35, 36. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the sex assault case was dismissed. I was 15 and it involved my girlfriend. And it was basically where her parents had gotten, you know, angry and that type of thing. And he said the robbery case, um, was he said it wasn't us. And to her credit, the prosecutor actually did mention to the judge, Your Honor, the sex assault case was dismissed and the um, um, D DA's office refused to accept charges on the robbery case, which the judge, I believe, had to have known when he was looking at the criminal history. Um, but regardless, those were cases that were, even if they had been convictions, they were from 20 years prior, okay? So if you have a judge that does that, it is important to try to address those issues you know, for your client. It is important to note that um, all of the information related to the PSA, um, the Arnold Foundation has on their website. As mentioned, they really want to be transparent. They want to provide the risk factors, the algorithm, the scoring, um, so that anyone can go on and see how it's done because they're trying to differentiate their assessment tool from other tools that judges may use to determine pretrial release. Um, it is important to make sure that um, if you are using the PSA, occasionally go onto the website, reread the instructions and directions. Um, I actually had to send an email to a pretrial supervisor the other night to ask a question. And because I had a client that was scored out at 6'4". He was charged with burglary of a building. And he was an older gentleman, had priors, but when I looked at his priors, he had three, I'm sorry, he had four prior burglaries of a building, which is a state jail felony. One was in 2004, the other three were from 1998, I'm sorry, 1988 to 1992. Okay. And then he had a possession of a controlled substance case, less than a gram and some other like random state jail felony theft case. Okay. But he had this high six, four score. And it said that he had a new violent criminal activity flag. It said he had three or more prior violent convictions. So I sent an email to the pretrial office supervisor and you know, attached the PSA, attached the information from the Arnold Foundation. And I said, hey, does he have criminal history that I'm not aware of? Um, because if the burglary of a building charges or what's being used to be as his violent offenses, I said, according to the information provided by the Arnold Foundation, 
burglary of a habitation is what's considered a violent offense, not burglary of a building, um, which if they've used the wrong offense, you know, he had a significantly higher score and it looked significantly worse than what it was. There is a big difference, in my opinion, between breaking into a building and breaking into someone's home, which is burglary of a habitation. So it is really important to know the tool, understand it, know what the requirements are, and to make sure that it's being scored properly and implemented correctly. Um, because the whole purpose is to help the judge decide whether to release a defendant pretrial and what type of conditions to impose. Thank you.